This is uh, welcome to um, geez, what number is this? Eighteen. This is Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, number eighteen, live from a secret location out in the middle of the desert where it's hotter than hot. Hot, yeah. It's Africa hot. You've heard of that term before, right? Yeah, I don't know if we're quite on that level. We're not at Africa hot, but it's hot. It's hot. And we're doing some rally training. Um, and this is Andrew Short, who's a rock star, husky, factory rally racer. Rockstar Energy. Rockstar Energy. Husqvarna. Husqvarna. Factory racing. Factory racing. <laughs> Got that right. Um, we were going to prep, but we were out rally training, and it was hot, and our brains were a little fried. So if we seem like we're a little bit, you know... Not all together today. That's uh, completely normal. Um, we Behind the scenes, we have Ricky Brabeck manning the cameras. Yeah, he's he's kind of fried too because he's been trying to you know keep up with us. <laughs> I, I, laid, I laid down some pretty fast times today. I'm happy to say. When you were off the road book. <laughs> uh, well, I built the road book and it wasn't that good. And then that I made good. mistakes. And then. Um, I'm trying to figure out how you guys use ESP and figure out how to where to go. Because I used to have that, but I don't have it anymore. So, um, anyways, uh, thanks for joining in. Um, so, what we're going to do tonight is I have a couple of questions that I'm going to try to remember um, that people asked me because I didn't do any show prep either for this. But I do have one thing that I'm going to maybe I was told not to talk about this, but I might talk about it a little bit later because I got an email. Um, it has to, oh, it's a long story. So we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes. Um, and, uh, Hey, you know what, you know who I see on the, on the post there, George? Um, what's her name? <laughs> don't, don't do it. Okay. Got it. Uh, I got to figure out how to make this thing work here on my side. So, um, I, the, the one, the, what was the one, the one question I got to, there was another question. See, the problem is, is all my questions are usually on my phone, which is like recording us right now. And then my other phone is controlling the thing that we're, the other thing we're recording on. This is perfect. And my computer is um, not being friendly right now. What do you mean it's perfect? No, because it's <laughs> going to be natural this way. Yeah, okay. So we had Ricky on this. Um, I'm looking. Oh, there we go. New comments. I got it working, I think. I think I got it working. It's better than... There we go. Look at that. Amazing. Okay. Um, are you going to tell us that you're putting on another Harden drill? Me? No, I'm not going to tell you that. Jameson, where, what rumors have you been hearing? Because I've been hearing some rumors too, but I didn't, uh, I don't know anything about me and Harden drills. Actually, I put some Harden drill sections in the roadbook today on accident. But your roadbook had hard into a section. We had to take them out. Yeah. So the funny thing is, is when we're when we're doing this rally training stuff, uh, uh, part of the part of the drills is making actually making the roadbooks. And so we have uh, an application called Tulip that um, you can use. It uses Google Earth, and we can um, play around with you know the track logs. We can drop track logs in. We can make routes and Andrew has been really proactive in doing that and uh, he he made a few routes and I made a few routes where we're at and the good thing when we train and practice that way is you learn a lot about how to get in the head of the guy who's making the map books and when Andrew sent me over his um, <laughs> remember when you sent your things I said yeah you don't want to go through there because like everything in, in this area has like Cactus. A lot of cactus. Yeah. A lot of cactus. A lot of a lot of pricks. But my arms look pretty good. Yeah. yeah not too bad. Yeah, I didn't. I don't. I don't ride through the bushes. But there, there's also a lot of rocks. Yeah. And we had some uh, river washes that kind of turned into uh, more or less hard enduro um, thing. And uh, somebody wants us to put WD-40 on the door hinges, Ricky. I want to talk to your dad about that. <laughs> Somebody complained about the air conditioner noise too, because I mean we need that going no matter what. I yeah. I wanted to shut it down, but um, we can't do that. And somebody wants to know who's Andrew. So Andrew, tell everybody who you are. Who I am? Well, I'm 36 years old and I'm a motorcycle addict. <laughs> I like to ride dirt bikes. Oh, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Andrew was a former KTM factory rider, motocross. Yeah, for a little bit, one year just with KTM. But former Honda 
motocross yep. and by motocross i mean motocross supercross yeah so i rode for factory honda from 2005 through 2010 uh, i was part of their pro part of the program again later on in my career 2016-17 for um like an ambassador but testing role with the team and so i've uh been with the husqvarna team now this will be my third year i'm coming up on my third year and I got hooked uh, on off-road when I was done racing motocross and supercross. Obviously, that was my first passion was uh, motocross as a kid and then later on supercross. And after that, I loved trail riding. So now to transition into this and I discovered rally later on, which is uh, the biggest passion I have right now. So I love dirt bikes. I love what it's all about. And for me, um, I feel very fortunate to wake up and live my dream. Yeah. And that's exactly what you think, like after 180 kilometers in 108 degree today? Yeah. <laughs> no, for me, it's, honestly, like sometimes when I used to race motocross, you would do uh, the second motos or whatever, and it'd be so hot and humid, and it's different. Like you get cooked from the inside out. Yeah. Here in the desert, as long as you keep moving, it's not so bad. Yeah. Um, the first time I did try rally, I was with Johnny Campbell with um, – another oh, team that was and, the that was the the gnarly desert test yeah and i about died <laughs> so after that i bought a tracker you and three other guys yeah tracker sat phone um all that stuff so i learned from the heat and the desert uh to respect it and so those are some of the things i carry with me trail riding now all the time is my sat phone my tracker and uh i think more about um, where i'm going before i get out there and it's too late now <laughs> So and one and, and a lot of the people I've worked with and Andrew is probably one of the most prepared uh, guys I've ever you know he has he has a sheet with his medical emergency all the all the in, important information on it and like he opens up his his little box that he has inside of his trailer and all the stuff is super neatly organized. Yeah, I don't he, love that. He, no, I I'm telling you, you look at my bike and I mean you just must look at it and think what a jalopy. It's like this guy ever washed his bike. And then and Andrew's bike is just like it looks like it's ready for lining for national. No, I did it, notice your bike was pretty clean though when we got here, and it had new tires or newish tires. Yeah, it is. It was. It's it's kind of prepped in a weird, strange way. And maybe then you know I don't really worry about the stickers because you're the one that has to look at it when I'm you know passing you. Yeah. <laughs> full throttle. I don't think I went full throttle. That's the at thing all. though. Like motocross guys, they look all fancy and have all the nice stuff, but most of us can't ride. And then there's some desert dude that their stuff's falling apart and they just blow right by you they got skills so yeah i, I don't know what to think i i i well you i'd say, rather have the you skills say, you and go fast you say we can't ride because you you can ride um yeah. but the funny thing is is like it and i just remember back from the old days when you had to like you know paint your own helmet or put stickers yeah. on it or something oh, yeah. like that and now i mean you can buy your way into looking like factory you can buy a factory edition motorcycle yeah and you can get the same rider like a week later as the kit that you raced with at the national last weekend yeah. you can roll up the thing in your you know brand new tonka truck with your everything just rolled out and and like factory easy up and and then you see the guy over on the you know on the novice track <laughs> you know never never cracking the throttle yeah and 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 then i mean you get you get kind of all ranges of it and stuff yeah. like that but it's amazing the ability to, to have the, the cool equipment and the and the and the good stuff and but I think the industry needs all that, you know, yeah. that, that dude that spends all the money with the power sport industry, those people are crucial and they help out the local dealer or online retailer, whatnot, whatever it is. But I on mean, the other there's, 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 you have there's, full enthusiast who just makes everything happen, you know? So I think it's and I, you cool know, I, to see both sides. And I, I've been lucky to be in the industry for so long to where, you know, as a, as a journalist, I was literally like a factory rider. And yeah. it was, I felt spoiled sometimes, but I always remember my roots where I came from. I remember taking tires off and turning them around and spinning them the other way because I couldn't afford a new tire. And so, like, if I was going to practice on a tire, I'd, like, you know, I'd take my race tires off and put practice tires on. And then, like, a race tire would get spun around the other way and raced again. And yeah. then and then it turned into a practice tire. Yeah. And little things like that. And, like, so, so. Okay, so I got a question for you. For me. As a spoiled motocross guy, when you change your oil, do you always change the oil filter with it? No. You just change it, the oil? The, like, yeah, like, I get two... I get two or three oil changes, and then I'll do the filter. filter. Yeah. That is so weird to me. Yeah. I think maybe it's just motocross mentality, but every time I change the oil, I change the filter. That's that's factory. That's full right. factory level, and at the, at, the highest, at the highest, highest level, that's probably the way you should do it. But at the same time, if if you're if nothing's going wrong in your motor, 
yeah. and, and everything's good, then the filter hasn't done anything. It's just passing oil through it because yeah. there's no there's not really any contaminants. Do you ever use the metal filters? Yeah. I don't understand. I always use the paper ones. Yeah, so I, ones. so this is a good question. See, yeah. you're allowed to ask me questions. But this too. is something that this motocross is, guys, I, I swear to you, everybody I know always changes the oil filter. But maybe we're just spoiled. That's no, it's not spoiled. It's it's probably the best way to do it. It's to change your oil often and yeah. to change your filter often is Okay, is, so how many hours do you change your oil? On a four fifty or five hundred, like an EXE or a four <laughs> four fifty. Off road. We're not talking motocross. Yeah, yeah off road. I'm because when I race motocross, well, I would ride literally like one or two days. My mechanic would change the oil. Yeah, I. So you can you can go on the early side, you which would is do, how many hours? The early side would be what the manual tells you. Fifteen hours, like if you're a KTM like, or I, I think the, I think like the Yamaha is twelve. On I, I I remember looking at the app lately, but it's like twelve, and I think I've seen as low as eight in a manual, and I've seen up to like fifteen or fourteen or fifteen, and. and and then, so at 15 hours, you're only changing the oil. You're not doing a filter. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What about you, Ricky? How many how many hours before you change the oil? Uh, play riding on uh, your X or your L or whatever. You know, your off road bike. Play riding like six hours normally. Like six hours. Yeah, like two or three rides. Huh. Yeah. I mean, if you're riding, dude, I go like every 10 hours. Hey, if you're riding it hard and you have an oil sponsor, I would absolutely do it like that. Yeah. But oh, dude, like, then your oil bucket's full all the time. Smudge pot. Shh. No, not smudge pot. Just like you take it to the the, the, the recycle, the green oh, recycle yeah. place. Same. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, but anyways, I, I go, so here's, here's the funny thing is, is like, I look at the color of the oil inside the motor, you yeah. know, like, cause I have the view screen and most of yeah. my KTMs or something, or if I don't, I'll take the oil cap after the bike's been running a little bit, I'll take the, the, the filler cap off. And I'll just like put it on a on a paper towel and look yeah. at it. Sometimes I'll take it and I'll and I'll you know um, uh, feel it. Yeah. And and it's funny because I even I even saw uh, an, a kid that does this thing called uh, what's his called Torture Test Magazine or something like that. And he actually sent oil samples from some bike. He 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 basically bought a bike. He was just going to ride it until it died. And he was sending the oil samples in, and he was like putting ridiculous amounts of time in this thing, and the oil was still actually pretty good. Doing and it's funny because this is probably like the fifth show in a row where we've had some oil, oil yeah. w- question, viscosity. Tires thing. are the same way, right? Yeah. Like everyone has the perfect tire that and, they like. And so so I need to get I need to get one of my friends who's a good who's a who's a petroleum engineer in here to answer these kind of questions in a professional level. But I have I mean you see my fleet of crap. I mean really good bikes that I have. Yeah. You have do, a lot do, of do they, do they ever break? Have you ever seen them break? Well, I never see you riding them. What do you mean? You're always on your route. Like when I'm, oh yeah, you always ride the same bike. Yeah, yeah. So that's my that's my quote rally 500. Yeah, yeah but I have a trail riding 500. I have a trail riding 350, yeah. and then I have, you all have a lot bikes. of bikes. They all work. They all work, and they all run for the most part. They need a little bit of maintenance. <laughs> no, they need a little bit of maintenance no, every once in a while. That many bikes, sure. So I've I've and I've you know I've always done this, but. So I'll, I'll just kind of, I just kind of, it's more like a feeling than it is actually a, a time yeah. level. And I, I write on the cases with a little felt tip marker, like the date and, and if they have an hour meter on yeah. hours when they've been, when the oil has been changed. So I can kind of keep track of it. What if a bike's been sitting? Like I have a bike that's been sitting for two years and, you know, me and my wife, we might go to the mountains this summer. Does, and it doesn't have much time on it. I think it only has like two or three hours on it. But it's been two years. You change the oil? I don't think you need to. It, it sometimes, like, like um, it can, you know, in moist environments, it can attract yeah. water and stuff like that. If it hasn't, if it hasn't been run, the very first time you run it, and if there's contamination, okay. And stuff so in there, what about your, out. what you, about your oil that you've had sitting on the shelf? And you're like, man, I got to change the oil, but this oil has been sitting here for ten I think years. It's, I think it's still fine. good. I'd run it. Just I'd shake totally, it up. I totally run it. Yeah, shake it. Shake well. Shake it up. Yeah, shake it up and run it. Huh. I'm sure somebody. Um, <laughs> San Felipe Bob says he would smell the oil. Yeah. yeah, um, and since I got you burnt me, so you get a compliment for that. Evidently, somehow or another, I don't um, know how you. Let's see, oil viscosity um, can change a lot by how hard you are cranking the engine. You guys are yeah. pros. Yeah, sure. Like if you go ride in the sand, if you're if you're like on the clutch. Okay, so here's how you kill your oil. Use the clutch. Just slip slip the crap out of the clutch, and that'll destroy your oil. Yeah. Um, but don't you know? Don't run you know? Don't run at a higher PM stuff like that. So. No, that's a that's a that's a really good question. It's kind of interesting. I mean, 
if if you have the money, if you have the oil, if you have the filters, you, the more you change it, it's not going to hurt anything to change it too much yeah. unless you don't tighten the drain plug. Okay, right. so what else if your bike's been sitting there for two years? What do you have to check? Because the air, no, they're fuel air, injected. The air filter, the air filter dries out. Yeah, because the oil always it drips dry. down, so the air filter will dry out. Um, sometimes drain you know, the, the gas. Yeah, the gas, gas in, in a plastic container. Filter, in, a, in a plastic container, any sort of plastic container, the gas permeates. It loses octane. Yeah. It, it's it doesn't. It's not any good, especially if it's a clear tank. You know where you can see the opaque tank. Um, that's even worse. But gas goes bad. Um, you know, I mean, but the I rest should be good. Huh? Yeah, I think it's. I think the bike's fine. Grease. You know, if if you know if it hasn't been moved, I think moving it would move the grease around a little bit again. But you know, maybe grease some stuff. But they're pretty bikes are pretty good these days. What do you do with your bikes before? Like you have so many bikes sitting there. I guess most of them get ridden. They quite get often. they get used. Uh, you know, in the warm in the cooler months, they get used twice a month. Yeah. You know, or at least started up. Even if the ones it, we pull them all out, we start them up before every class. Make yeah. sure you know that helps run some gas through them. And if the if one of them's finicky, we take it and run it up and down the road. You know, to to, to put a little gas through it and stuff like that. So a cooler that's, month. A cooler month, the cooler month, like during the winter. That's not like a cooler that you keep your suds in. Which, uh, by the way, I have a suds right now. Andrew was gonna, you were gonna make a kombucha. Kombucha. Where? Oh, uh, well, they're in the kombucha, trailer. Kombucha. Ma- 110 degrees right now. Oh, kombucha margarita. Yeah. Right. Is that margarita. What <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, love it's, me a margarita. If you're, if that's only if you're cheating. But we're training right now. It's full, super gnarly training regiment. It's almost like Baker's Factory, except completely different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little so, more intense. Mm-hmm. A little more intense here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got I got a regiment. It's called the Jimbo Program. And if you don't know about it, Johnny Campbell knows about the Jimbo Program. Has he lived with me when I was on this program? I've heard about it. I designed it myself. Pizza and beer. It's top ramen and ketchup, bud. It's eat, oh. it's eat whatever you want. That's my that's my training program. And it 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 really revolves around the fact that your body is a human garbage disposal. And and because when you're on rallies, you, you know you can't really – I mean, you guys are – it's different now a little bit. But you can't control the food you're going to get, no. right? So sometimes – and I know these guys that train to a high level and they ate special food. And I couldn't wait for them to just roll out some like in the middle of Africa in like Agadez. They roll out a seafood platter. I'm like, yes, tomorrow I'm going to win. Because <laughs> like like these guys they you know that had special food and stuff. Sometimes you're on a marathon stage, you don't yeah. get your special food, and and they would start detonating. And I was used to running on 87 octane, so yeah. Um, what a load of crap. <laughs> That's how stress is now. So yeah, I mean, well, I mean, coming from a you know, you, 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 and that's interesting for me, you know, to, to see the level that you, you motocross guys were training at and the fitness level, because it's insane, yeah. but it's a controlled environment. You can, can you know how long you're going to race for, yeah. you have an idea what the temperature is going to be, you know, you're going to get your food at your times and, yeah. and all that stuff. Like on the rally, sometimes you, you don't know if you're going to eat a lunch or not, or, yeah. or what the food, like I said, if they rolled the seafood platter out, I got scared, but I always knew I could go around the back of the truck and serve the food, and the guy would give me a big plate of pasta, and I would go get the little ketchups and tear them open. And <laughs> Ketchup and <laughs> jam. Top. That was, that was that, you're just looking for energy at that yeah. point. It's just like, I need to, I need to eat. Yeah. So. The best part about rally is you don't know what's around the next turn, and it could be during the race, it could be <laughs> transferring back, and it could be the bivouac. Yeah, it could be the bivouac, but you come around the turn, and there's some lady standing there with the organization with a stack of papers saying, okay, this is how you get back, and it's, you know, you just make it happen. Yeah. Adapt. Yeah, rally life. Rally life. Rally life. So that, that's what we're doing even today with uh, with our with our map books because um, we so so Andrew made like I didn't get to ride it because I was sitting in the truck. I was I was um, I was uh, what do we call it? What do I do when I sit in the truck? I surf the internet for like. Whatever. I don't know what you do. Yeah. Well, so I, wa- I I watch trackers and <laughs> make yeah. sure you guys are moving. Spot buddy. Boss, well, you guys came back and you're like, oh, it was the best stage ever. It was so good. Jimmy, you got to go ride it. And I'm like, oh. And I was all amped to go because I wanted to ride the one that you I You were dressed on. and ready. I was ready to go. Well, I got dressed. That's what I did while you guys were out riding. And then and I was waiting for George and, and Mitch to come, you know, because they're they're going to drive and help, help us transport trucks. And I was worried about them because they're, you know, snowflakes and they're riding across the desert on their dual sport bikes. Having fun. They could die. 
at any moment because they're old people. And uh, no, love. they showed up with a watermelon. Yeah, but they took the truck and store and got the watermelon <laughs> on the way home. That's how they don't. They didn't ride from this front with, the, with a watermelon. <laughs> That's dessert, by the way. Because I would get big ice creams and stuff. Jimbo program allows for ice cream with ice cream with a sprinkle sprinkles on it. But uh, this this one we can do, we're gonna do um, watermelon. But uh, so I was I they came back and they said this is the best road book ever and 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 I'm like okay let's do mine because mine's gonna be super awesome and then it, it like went through fences and then there was areas yeah. that had been changed and the roads weren't there and then it's tough to I made stuff. I made a mistake uh, like where we were doing some I went I didn't do the I didn't do what I said like I didn't do what the road book told me to do and. And then what about the one on the way back in? The one that you made that completely I went left the wrong way out of the gas station. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I'm still learning and I'm uh, I'm supposed to be a professional. So good times. Um anyways, let's go, let's roll through and see if we got any uh, any questions here that we can answer. <clears throat> let's see. Everybody hopes that I'm gonna still put on another hard and Andrew, if I put on a King of the Motos, would you ride it? No. Hey, let's talk about Extreme Enduro, like the series that got canceled and then Pinard. The Enduro Cross. Yeah. Eric, Somebody else. Eric Pinard will probably bring that back. Yeah, I mean, well, they Eric, announced three rounds, right? Yeah. Eric um, invented Enduro Cross. I mean, yeah. brought, brought Enduro Cross to the United States yeah. and did a really good job with it. And you, know, you know from the motocross side, because he was bringing American riders over to Bursi and yeah. And, and as a promoter, he's, I think, one of the best. Yeah. Because he seems like, it, like most promoters are just trying to figure out how to line their pockets with gold and then stuff money inside of it. <laughs> and, like, it seemed like Eric was always trying to make it good for everybody. Yeah, you he know? does. He's a good guy. And uh, and so he brought, he, he when he saw Enduro Cross, or Enduro, I don't even know what they call it, whatever Super they call Enduro it in like Europe, it was, yeah. it was, they were, but he brought it over here and he did the one at the Orleans. And I was lucky enough to, to race one of the first ones. I think I raced the first one. And um, I, I loved it, but I was too old at that point to to really try anything. <laughs> but he, you know, so he built that series to what it was, and then he actually sold it to the company that I used to work for when I was at Dirt Rider Magazine. Yeah, they they kind of bought it and they took it over, and then they just recently sold it. And slowly, it slowly, you know, they they like anything. They're like, look at how much money we're going to make. All this money, we're going to make it bigger. And then all of a sudden, since we can't make Dirt Rider and Duro. Cross magazine. All of a sudden, they blame me for the shrink of Enduro Cross, which is basically they cut costs and cut staff and and, and just typical business. And it went down. And, and they always kind of had Eric, Eric, and uh, you know his team there to kind of bring it around. And then it got sold again and sold again. And all of a yeah. sudden, Eric wasn't involved, and you kind of saw where that went. But then it disappeared, or they canceled the last minute, yeah. which is a shame because I think that like that's like super cross for off road people. Yeah, and and if you have never been to an enduro cross, you need to go. You need to go watch one because it's 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 like taking all the gnarly stuff, um, from like at a GNCC or or you it's know just like, action packed right, and you see people on the limit. There's stuff. There's crazy stuff all the time, but it, 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 you get to see that, and you get to watch the best riders in the world do stuff, and they make it look easy. I always thought they needed to have to just two amateurs come out first thing, first lap, you know, before the show starts. Like, have two amateurs just come out and ride around it because they, yeah. they're like your buddy Bob and Steve. Yeah. And let Bob and Steve go ride it to show you how gnarly this course yeah. is. And they would bring out, like, an amateur class, and, and it, it kind of exemplified it. But the problem with the top riders now at Endurocross, like Supercross, when was the last time you saw a top rider roll the triple? Yeah, no, it doesn't they, happen. They, they go out on the parade lap or, you know, on yeah. the, on the, on the, the show lap. And the, the first thing they do is huck it. So it's the same thing with the enduro cross obstacles. And, and now those guys, the way that they train, if you let them ride around something once or maybe twice, they, yeah, they learn it. it. They, yeah. they, they'll track walk it. They'll say, oh, my tire is going to hit here. I'm going to bounce there and go there. So in some ways I think they need to make the tr- tracks harder, but then I think like they have this awesome series and it sounds like Pinard and those guys are going to put on three rounds and, People ask you about a hard enduro if you're going to put on. It'd be cool if they could do like three rounds indoors and maybe do three rounds outdoors. They had the last dog standing last yeah. week, and I know it's not the same organizer or something, but so it's a I district. It's a, a district thirty-seven yeah. club that puts on a really awesome event, and they they actually had. Um, uh, it'd be cool to see both, you know, like have those riders, you know, like Colton, he could crush it indoors and then you have to work a little bit more for this stuff on the outdoors yeah. or vice Cody, versa. Cody you know? does everything well. Yeah. He's super well-rounded. And, and it was, 
it's, I don't know. It would be cool to see for that because there's a need for it if people are asking you if you know, yeah. you're going to put it on. People sound well, like it. Most of the guys that are asking me are like amateur riders that were yeah. the real fans of King of the Motos. And they, they're and it, there's there's this very small but super core group of of riders that like to do this extreme enduro stuff because yeah. it's it's hard on your equipment. It, it, you, yeah. You've got to practice it. And they, they these guys get excited when they DNF. And most, yeah. most, most, because they're like, I went this far and they want that race to be so hard. And that, that was my goal when I put on the race. It's like, I want to have one finisher. Yeah. I want to have one finisher cross the finish line, keel over and die. Yeah. That was the way I, and people you like, achieved that, right? I kind of pretty much. almost did. Yeah. yeah. Pretty close. But it was like, I want you to be, when you're finished, I want you to be finished. I want there to be nothing left and no one else can finish it. Yeah. And, and then that was the you know, kind of ultimate goal. And I got to ride some extreme endros that were built like that when I was younger in, in like what? the Josele classic, mm-hmm. which is one of the yeah. very early extreme enduros. And, uh, and, and, you know, I've done similar to like Erzberg today. It makes, compare? it makes Erzberg look easy. Wow. And, 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 and Erzberg is getting tougher. They've making it yeah. tough because the riders get so much better. But, um, back in the old days, the, the two years I did the Josele classic, I think they had three and four finishers, three, wow. one year and four the next. And, and I missed the cutoff on the year. And if I would have made one more CP, like the 14 of us got pulled off at CP. And the, the four guys that went in front of us all finished. I'm like, oh, I was so close. But I was stuck in a bog for an hour now. Yeah. Like literally, like in a bog, like up to here in Pete Moss. And the little French lady hiked down the hill and helped me extract yeah, yeah. extract my bike. But, um, you, you know, like those gnarly, the, the gnarly. And then and then the last one I ever did was Romaniacs. It was the last mm-hmm. one I really did. Uh, that would it it showed me that I no longer have the ability or skill level to ride extreme and at the top level. And this yeah. is when Jarvis was uh, coming up and and Chris Birch, Chris such, Birch was winning yeah. it and and these guys were they they were on a different planet as far as I was concerned because yeah. they had this super strong trials background, amazing bike control, and were able to just do stuff. And if you weren't one of the first guys there, and this is when people would come out of the forest and help a lot. Yeah. And if you were kind of behind the lead pack, the people in the forest would disappear and go to the next section. <laughs> and you and your you and your six other yeah, guys yeah. Are, are tugging your yeah. bike up, you know, and all the other riders. So, mm-hmm. so it, it's times are changed. Extreme endros change. They had to limit a lot of the the, the spectator help. And yeah. um, but uh, and like King of the Motos for dirt bikes, it sailed or where's that at? Uh, the, the, the 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 for the most part, the ship has sailed. Yeah. Um, it's it's. It's always in the back of my head. I mean, I, I, I don't know how I can make a better one than the last one I did. I have ways to make it better, but I was really concerned about safety. You know, I wanted to make I wanted to make that that uh, you know I wanted to make it a super tough race, but I also wanted to be safe from a spectator and a and a rider standpoint. Yeah. And we just had so sure. many spectators, and and it just it was kind of crazy. So yeah, I just felt it was. Uh, for me, it was time at least. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but they, they, these guys still want still want the uh, the the stuff back. So, um, okay, we're gonna quit talking about my crap. We're gonna talk about your stuff. Let's see what we hear. Are you guys riding through the heat of the day? Early morning starts before the heat. Well, Jesse, we are trying, but um, I'm I'm not good at cracking the whip on these guys. They're up early. I'm not kidding you. Like Ricky was rolling at what four this morning. Yeah, I don't know. That's I wake up at five, and we yeah. left at six fifteen. You're morning. you're at five, yeah. You're at five, and and you woke me up. So, um, they rode in the yeah. We did ride in the heat because it was what one oh eight when we got back down here. Yeah, it was solid. More um, or less, we were done by two thirty or something. Did somebody wants to know? Did Andrew at least take a shower before this? Well, I'm sitting next to him, and he's taken more showers than I have because I just went swimming. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, uh, let's see. Did you guys ride with jackets all day? They have special jackets. Talk about your jackets. Uh, the rally jackets. Ours are vented. And everything's purpose built. So in your pockets, you basically they build pockets for everything you carry. So earlier I mentioned I carry a tracker, sat phone. I carry a little plastic Ziploc bag full of all kinds of stuff from a Camelback. Uh, the mouthpiece. Yeah. Um, in case I lose that There's rubber glove. Medical stuff. Yeah, I have medical stuff on the front of my bike oh, that's now. Where it's at, yeah. yeah, but Leatherman tools, all that stuff. I try to carry it with me, and I carry some food and whatnot. But your phone. We have a place for a passport and all that for when we race. So yeah. Passport. Why would you need a passport when you ride a motorcycle? Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, let's see. My it's... passport's gone right now. Actually, hopefully, I get my visa for Russia soon. 
Oh yeah. So you're, where, where's, where's, your, where's your next? Where's your next race? That that's one that I always wanted to do. Yeah, Russia, Mongolia, China. The Silkway Rally it starts yeah. in the beginning of July. And I'm excited to go. Hopefully, I get the visa stuff figured out. Yeah. Before then, I've heard. I've heard. I remember Heinz Kindergarten told me he's like, Jimmy, you must come and race Mongolia. I'm like, why? And he goes, all grass, no stones. <laughs> so he's basically saying that's the way to say in in, in Austrian. Giant golf course. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I want to I wanna, yeah. I wanna do that. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was difficult back then. It was, yeah. it was tougher. Hey, there's so. like two people I've never – like I knew Hines was a bad dude, but I didn't know that much, you know, about him. Yeah. So I would rally him and um, Alfie Cox. I never oh. knew – as a motocross guy, I never knew who Alfie Cox was. Yeah. And I saw him in Morocco riding. I guess he's like a legend. Yeah, so Alfie was you racing at the same time. As, crazy dude. Same time as me. No, not crazy. He was – he was fast. He came over and raced in the United States, did some Baja racing and stuff yeah. just to, to, to get faster. And uh, I, I had a really good relationship with Alfie, Alfie but Alfie could, and, and he'd probably kill me if I say this out loud, but I'm going in. Alfie could not navigate his way out of a lunchbox. Really? Oh, he was horrible at navigation. But really fast. He would pin it. He yeah. was good at pinning. He was a fast motorcycle rider. But it's like, it was, and everybody knew it because he was one of those guys that could chase. He could, he could chase from behind and win yeah. stages easy. And if Alfie had like a day where he got sixth or seventh, he was super primed to win the stage the next day because he would catch up. And he yeah. was really good at it. But in in the long longer stages, you know, you end up packing up. You end up been riding in a group. Yeah. Everybody groups up. And I remember it was like kind of a known thing amongst the riders. Like if Alfie caught, you knew he was gonna. And it, so just all all the riders were just he would sit on you, but everybody yeah. would slow down, slow down, slow down. Everybody wanted Alfie to lead, yeah. and they'd let him go because they knew you can make a mistake, and then everybody tried to ditch Crazy him. Crazy dude, though. No. Yeah, yeah, but no, what super good guy. Yeah, let's see. Ask Andrew what he has the dinner before the race, please. Huh. If I race motocross, I would eat something just normal protein. Uh, some vegetables and some carbs like brown rice or whatnot. Really plain and exactly what Jim you would say. Um, really cookie cutter for motor- motocross because I didn't want to have an upset stomach and I'd eat really plain like in terms of seasoning and all that. But now with rally, it's like you just eat whatever you're you're presented with. So I think if you're uh, if you're looking for advice on food and fitness, there's so many articles that can guide you. But you got to trust your body on what you feel best um, in terms of performance, and just be smart and don't get too crazy with it. Yeah, you have to learn what how your body responds. How, how, yeah, and and don't change anything too crazy for race day. No. But for rally, it's whatever. Like, <laughs> Not as strict, basically. Yeah, like this morning I had oatmeal with some almond butter and some fruit and some eggs. Jimmy had nothing. He I had just, a case bar. He's a camel. I had a case bar. Yeah. I had a case bar, and then I had pizza. For dinner. Pizza. Pizza for dinner. Yeah. It was a cheat. Pizza. Um, let's see. Any advice for deep sand on big bikes? Seems like at slower speeds, sitting down is better because of lower center of gravity as a B rider. Ooh. I'd say momentum is key. I would be terrified on 1190 in the sand myself. Yeah. I, I, I am too. I ride yeah. them all the time. I you, you have to respect that bike because it outweighs you by twice. Yeah. So you can throw every bit of your muscles at that bike if it's going the wrong way, you exactly. still lose. Yeah. So, um, Kip, uh, as as a I'm gonna switch over to riding coach like thing. Um, you want to make sure that you're balanced when you're in the sand, and you want. Like, what do you mean by balance? Like further back? No, 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 no. Front, balance on your feet. neutral. No, neutral. Balanced on your feet. You don't think we think about it. when you're riding the sand, you don't really get back. You fold down a little bit because how fast you're going. But you don't actually get back and hang off the back of the bike. Oh, yeah, all the time. What? Keep oh, the front geez. end light. But uh, me on 1190? No, no, how do you keep the front end light? You keep the front end light with a throttle. Yeah, but I also get back. Yeah, it's but more, it's more, it's more for, air, for you guys, it's more about aerodynamics and stabilizing and bracing for the impact when it yeah, kind of comes out of nowhere. And you can see. Yeah. You but on 1190, I don't know if I'd want to get back. That's why you I don't want to get back. You, st- I, I, you don't want to go that fast. That If you have to get back, on your 1190, you're going, you're going way too fast. Because yeah, it's going to go in and just it's, throw you over. It's going to do – it's going to – it's like – because when you go back, you're like a pendulum. And when you start swinging, yeah. you know, if it kicks like that, you're adding to that pendulum effect. Because you watch – you think about it. When you guys are just riding through the sand, and he's he's talking about B-level B level riders. Yeah, so average you, dude. you got to imagine like when you're just cruising through the sand. Are you back at all? No. There's the yeah. answer right there. No. You're standing up. You're yeah. neutral, relaxed. You're steering the bike with your feet. 
But he says sitting down is better. I wouldn't well, want to stand up he, if I wasn't he, going so very fast. He, I, uh, I would sit down. I'd almost put my skis out if I was on the No! Oh. Yes, dude. That'd <laughs> That's be terrifying. No, no. You stand up and ride slow. That's why he's not a riding coach. <laughs> the peanut, the uh, Andrew, you're dude, riding. You're gonna take. You're gonna take. Uh, I'd be ju- terrified on 1190 you, in the sand. So you're gonna take George's 1190. It's almost a husky. So you're gonna take George's 1190 and you're gonna ride it down to the, where that place we were just at. I'm not gonna say where we're at. You're gonna ride it down and just ride in that sand. And if you put your rudders out, you call it putting the rudders out. Yeah. I'm gonna have to fire you. Oh man, <laughs> no. You, you can you 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 can just trials ride it through the sand. They don't get stuck. They're amazing. If you just you just respect the traction, most people give it too much power and they expect yeah. Okay, it. so tell explain Wait. the throttle because so, dude, those things are fast. I had one for a while in 2013. I told yeah, you yeah, this. yeah. And those things are wicked fast. You said you were jumping it. I don't. Yeah, I jump was. It. Yeah. <laughs> so um so so really in in. Anytime you're riding, especially when you're riding a big bike, you want to be standing on the foot pegs because that way all your weight is available to control the motorcycle through the foot pegs. The minute you sit down, you're adding your weight to the bike. And so when it starts doing something bad, guess what? You're doing something bad. And for most people, they feel more comfortable when they sit down because they can put their legs out. And we don't ride with our legs out. You don't, you, when, when do you put your legs out when you're riding? When you're out of control, right? Well, I'm scared. Yeah. D- so like don't. I got an 1190 no. in sand. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, somehow you're reinforcing all of my techniques, uh, all my teaching techniques. I actually could go on a full tirade about this right now because of an email I got today from, uh, uh, I'll talk about it some other time. But somebody remind me to talk about that. Um, about, about, uh, and I assume brakes, like you don't get on the front brake in the sand on 1190. 100%, 100% of your braking power is in the front brake. In the, the rear, sand? The rear brake You're is gonna for control. You're going to go like this. It's no, just going to knife on you. you. Don't, don't, don't. The forks use, are too soft. Don't. It, a lot of it depends on this guy's suspension. Has he had suspension done and does he have good just tires? Just be delicate on the front brake. It's still going to slow. A little bit of front brake will slow you down 100% better than and a lot of For sure of he needs to turn the ABS off or whatever. Yes, like traction control, ABS, turn it off. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Kip, are we answering your question? Because we're just going to go into argument zone here. But <laughs> Kip, if I were don't, you, don't I would not the take the good, 1190 in the sand. Good, just get get some get some good tires. Come out to my class. I I do demos all the time where I I'm like riding There's around. Lots of sand I'm like sand. riding around in the sand with one hand on my 1190. And I got some advice for you, Kip. <laughs> Put your tent on your bike. Go ride a nice, beautiful road wherever you want. In the Colorado mountains. In the Colorado, that's where I would go. Camp. Enjoy that thing for what it's built for. Not the sand. <laughs> Stay away from the sand. It's fine. You can ride them all. I'll ride them all day in the sand. I guess it depends. Are we talking Dumont Dunes? Or are we talking like just a sandy road? I'd rather ride it in Dumont than a sandy road because, like, you can go anywhere in Dumont. You know, because the sandy road when you're confined, confined, yeah. and all of a sudden that bike wants to go off the road or something like that, they don't turn very. I mean, they. So what do you do in those situations? Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Yeah. You look ahead. Yeah. So we'll just slow down and make sure I'm balanced. So when I slow down, I don't tip over. Right. And the bike goes where I want it to go. What else we got on here? <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see. Wasn't uh, Quinn the only finisher at last KM? Yes. Uh, that was that was true. Um, He's a bad guy. This is this is Nar. Remember Dave Nar? Yeah. He, that's Dave from Enriquez. Yo, Jimmy. You, Jimmy. Yo, he's meant to say yo, right, Dave? Yo. <laughs> um, he has the Nar stickers. You, see, you probably had one tagged on your car. Passport needed for medical eval out of a foreign country. Um, it's needed to get into the country in the first place, but yeah, it helps when we don't ever want to talk about that. Andrew, why did you transition to rally? Did you change your workouts between rally and motocross? Yeah, I just changed the rally because it was the ultimate adventure and I was tired of, I wasn't tired, but I'd done supercross and motocross enough for so many years that I was ready for something else and you're, rally was the perfect You're addicted thing. to riding. Yeah, no, I love riding and trail riding. And then once I discovered rally, it was the ultimate of all that. So I'm hooked. And yeah. And my workouts, yeah. I, basically, I was so burnt out on riding my bicycle a certain time and quantity and everything for that. That with rally, I just try to ride my motorcycle as much as possible and have as much fun with it and try to be able to adapt to many different situations. Um, whether it's sand, whatever, and just be ready on all different things. So like, if I feel like riding my bicycle to train, I do. If yeah. I feel like working out, 
in the gym, I go do that. If I feel like doing long motos, I do that. Or I work on sprints. I, every no, day is different. Yeah, there's no, there's not like a, a super regiment no. plan. And I think that's the way rallies are. You don't, you know, you go to a rally and that's the beauty. South of America it. is different than a rally is going to be in yeah. Mongolia. And yeah. you're just riding, you just got to ride your motorcycle and do what the map book says. Yeah. Um, did you get tired today? I was more tired when we started, left over from yesterday. <laughs> And I don't know if it was just because caffeine hadn't kicked in yet or what, but I hooked a left when I was supposed to hook a right because the waypoint, I went towards the waypoint. and Kind of like how I rode out of the gas station? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, But after that, I felt good. Yeah. But sometimes, yeah, with rally, you deal with things differently. So sometimes Moves. your body's really tired and just fried and other days it's fine. Yeah, it's yeah. uh, it, it's interesting because I think physically, I mean – on on Dakar, you, yeah, you guys are pushing it hard. I mean, it's so crazy how fast you guys are pushing it. You're like physically tired at the end of stages, right? Oh yeah, you're more like emotionally or mentally tired than physically sometimes. Yeah, I always found that like but, especially in Baja racing, like people yeah. you get tired, and I'm like my head yeah. is done. But and but there was time, there was days in rallies where you would know, you would see how long the stages were, and you you almost had to plan. Like, I'm going to push today and get tired today so I can rest tomorrow. Yeah. And It's a and, cumulative effect. Yeah. It just happens over the whole just, event, from travel to no sleep, from re and whatnot. Andrew, <laughs> yeah, uh, does your head go uh, during long days on the pegs during the rallies? Do you sing or talk to yourself? I bet you Ricky sings. Yeah, or some people put in, <laughs> like, uh, headphones. Yeah, do you have earbuds jamming the tunes? Yeah. Do you ever find your mind drifting off the present? No, like, lots of people put in like some tens and go, but we're always paying attention to the speed. Yeah. And I don't want to get a speeding penalty. For one, you have to pay oh. a fine. Two, it's time. But like Laya, she can sit. We have a thing. It beeps at you when you're getting close to the speed. Yeah, speed zone. Yeah, the speed zone. And they have their headphones in, and they can still just sit there right at the limit. And for me to follow Laya, I always go over and like I'll get a penalty. But she can sit there the whole time, and she's jamming out the music the whole time. So I don't have that. Maybe I think it's chicks. You know how they can do two things at once. Um, I'm just a one thing at a time. Yeah, I'm I, just a normal guy. That, so I just sit there and think about whatever. I, I was actually I was actually um, had music in my ears the other day when I was riding, and I can't concentrate. I yeah. mean, even just on the train, like if I if I if I'm just cruising, no problem. But if if I'm actually like thinking hard, like that music, it it it, it if it's almost like if the rhythm isn't right for the way I'm riding. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's the objective, right? Like if you have six hours to commute, you put in some oh, on, tunes. on a transfer. Yeah, on the yeah, transfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't think anybody races with anything. Oh no, that, I think that yeah, yeah, yeah. On the on the transfers for sure. Um I wouldn't let's see. Andrew needs to take the class. No, he doesn't. Andrew could teach me a few things. Uh Andrew needs to take it. See everybody's telling you need to come take my class. <laughs> I, de- I take the Jenny Lewis class. Yeah, he does. He, but it's just how it's. I, I, I actually my whole class with Andrew's just fucking with him. I, I make road books, and and every time they come back and they they don't realize they're learning a lesson. Like Jimmy, you're fucking with me. Should have oh, said that out loud. The bad word. But anyways, um, it's it's like I always believe in experiential learn. You know, yeah. and, and you have to put you in that situation. You have to make manifest the situation. And these guys are so good now. I can't. I can't really screw with them anymore because they know all the tricks and, and now it's more about like really seeing when they make a mistake, how they correct it and trying to, you know, maybe improve on that or clean it up or react quicker. Yeah. React quicker. At this point it's, it's reputation it, and you figure it out. It's just like doing motos. It's like yeah. doing, it's like doing your motos and now we're, but unfortunately a moto is 270, how many you do? 270 K of road book. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. That's a moto. Just one. doesn't matter. Um, somebody that said that's the wrong guest. <laughs> no, <laughs> wait, what do you, I don't even know what you're replying to. Um, let's see. Uh, that's who he's trying to take. Do I just, I probably sold a couple spots in my class. Um, let's see. Uh, great answer, Jimmy and funny need to take your class. Yes. Good. See, um, and George is sitting next to me, but he felt the need to text me. You have 62 new comments. Hold on a crap. Second here. Um, let's see. Did anyone bring up Saudi Arabia? Are you guys protecting any new in engine and bike setup opposed to South America? So let's say um, Saudi Arabia, that's where the Dakar is going to be for the next five years, allegedly. Um, I, I've heard you talk about it before, and we've talked about it. And I feel 
that it's for the sport, for the sporting aspect of the event and stuff. The fact that we're back to desert that nobody has really home turf advantage on. Um, they have a new director at ASO, and I think that the rally could get really good, and especially some of the changes changes they're implementing. Uh, seems like it's going in a very positive direction. Yeah. Um, and and as far as the the country and stuff goes, I don't know. I haven't been there. Yeah. Um, I've heard definitely heard uh, very polar on both sides yeah. of it and stuff. I think but you can be... form your own opinion on the politics and. That's besides the point, but the sporting aspect. Because you guys, you guys are going there to have a race, yeah. and, and we all want to see a really good, awesome race. Yeah, and for me to comment on the other stuff, I think isn't for me to say, but in terms of the race going there, nobody has an advantage. I think that's great as a racer because nobody knows the terrain. So yeah. we all kind of know what it's similar to, but in terms of bike setup, whether it's motor or suspension, I think it looks kind of similar to what we race in Morocco. Um, it has a lot of mountain passes, stony um, terrain the first week, and then a lot of sand the second week. Um, so will, will for you guys, us, I think it'll be really similar to South America, yeah. but I think the biggest difference is people just aren't familiar with the terrain. You haven't raced five it's years ago. It's fair for everybody. Yeah. yeah, they have no experience. Whether that day, no one knows. Well, we were here two years ago, and we ran this tire. So I know it will last for 200K, so we're going to yeah. run this tire. Yeah. No one, no one knows, you know. Do you change your setup between like sand days and Sony mountain pass days? Yeah, you, for you, me, yeah. And a big difference in rally would be tires, because yeah. if it's stony, then the tire's not going to last all day. And um, I think the other thing too for me, like sand, I, I try to preload my forks, um, get them to stay up a little bit in the front end. Um, that seems just. A little bit of comfort and reserve in that yeah. aspect. Um, yeah, and there's little little things here and there, but for the most part, it's more just suspension and setup. Yeah, but the motor, your motor stays the same mm. most of the time. We yeah, I've gone up a tooth or two just yeah. so I'm not shifting all the time. You know, it, it'll help keep it in the power the whole time, and um, so I'm not in between gears. Yeah, I feel like with the sand, depending on the humidity, how soft they are, how hot it's been, whatnot. But gearing sometimes changes as well. Yeah, that's uh, and and then coming from the the motocross side, you guys used to do tons of testing. Yeah. And now you do a ton of testing on the rally bike. Which, yeah, not so much. I no, feel like it's just compared like compared to motocross, it's not nearly as much. Yeah, and it's always about just basically reliability, how to improve upon the part. You know, um, that's typically what it consists of. Yeah. And, and the performance uh, side isn't so important as reliability and just having a bike that works good in all general areas. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Uh, Marco wants to know if you know Chaz, the pro snowboarder that rides a rock star. Unfortunately, I don't. But yeah. he has to be a bad dude if you snowboard for <laughs> rock star. Yeah. Let's see. Are they going to be using camel toe air filters in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> is that a joke or is that, is that a name? Is that a name of something like that? Um, let's see. Um, okay, we got a lot of a lot of tests and stuff there. How are we doing here? Wow, we burnt up almost fifty minutes. That's yeah. not that's not too bad. I told told you it wasn't going to be that long. Yeah. What was the question I wanted to? I didn't I didn't want to. What was the question that somebody? Somebody, if I had my phone, I could answer the question because someone. Sent I want to know what you carry on your adventure. This guy with the eleven ninety. Uh huh. Like, adventure bike riding seems like fun, but what do you carry on your adventure bike? Like tools. tools? Like what do you keep in your bag? I always have. Do you always carry a tube. Yeah. So I always have. I always have something to repair, repair a flat tire, which generally consists of a front tube, a small little compressor. And tell people why you only carry a front. Because the front works in the front or the rear, and I run tubes in most of my adventure bikes. I mean, what someone, kind of tubes? A heavy duty front, like Ken. ultra heavy duty. No, not or ultra. Just regular? just regular heavy duty, not ultra. You're a Kenda guy. Kenda guy. Yeah, okay. Kenda's. So um, they support my schools completely. Everything else is wide open. I'll run anything, but yeah. So Kenda regular, like not light, but the heavy two. I run the. I run a. It's Best Rest Products makes this like bomb proof little um, pump. Like that an inflator that you inflator plug into the that you plug into the cigarette lighter or clip on the battery, and because sometimes you know you just it's better than pumping, you know. Yeah. And it's a heavy the bike's already heavy, so I can add a little bit of weight. And then and then I'll carry you know the tire irons that'll that'll the Motion Pro bead breaker tire irons is what I usually carry. How and many? Two. 
Yeah, you can do it with two. Uh, and sometimes three, if I use the Motion Pro one, that's the axle wrench also. Yeah. So then I'll have, I'll have three tire irons. Uh, but I carry that stuff specifically. Then I carry some little um, uh, kind of Motion Pro tool packs, these little like little zipper ones that have. How are those better than the KTM one that comes so, with your bike? So the KTM kit is awesome. Like it, How is the Motion Pro one better? Because they're tiny. They're little things. So oh. you have an 8, 10, 12. You have a set of sockets, and you have this little doohickey wrench we did it on dirt bike test we have a oh. test on uh, what's the thing called mp tool is what it's called so uh, brandon you should call me back by the way one of these and where do you keep all this stuff in uh one of the panniers oh yeah like the pannier that's that's french for this bag that hangs on the side yeah. of my bike what kind thing. of bag um giant wolfman. Loop, wolfman. Wolfman. Yeah. wolfman ones most of the time i have some giant loop ones but currently i'm running wolfman soft bags but i have tour tech hard bags and it depends on whether i'm going camping if i go camping i put this the hard bags scare me. Like, George has a hard bag. Tip, so. tip, fib, right? Uh, I guess. And when they yeah. chase your leg down, when you yeah. take your legs off when you're in the sand because you're yeah. scared. Yeah. The soft bags the don't soft look bags. as cool, but they seem more practical. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's It just depends on what you're doing. You know, it's like the hard bags are better for stacking stuff on top. Security. And, you can't get your stuff stolen as easy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You can lock lock it a little bit. Mm. Um, so, it's a... It's a mix, but it just depends on it depends on what I'm doing on the bike, you know, what I carry. But it's always tool. It's always mostly just for tire tire problems. That's really the only thing that's going to super strand you that that can be kind of fixed. But like you yeah. know, if you're going to break a chain, I don't like. You I'm ever like, carry gas or anything with you? I have a Camel ADV extra tank yeah. on the side, so I got plenty of range. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I got a lot of range. Um, let's see, we got a couple other questions that kind of came in here. Um, Somebody said I carry a mountain bike on my adventure bike. I do that. I've done that too. Let's see. Um, Jesse says he uses a uh, six oh can't get his six oh six off with a tire iron. What? Uh, rode those bikes, mammoth. Wait, hold on a second. Sitting down, both feet out in the sand. Heard that advice from a good source. <laughs> yeah, right. Andrew. Yeah, it, when you do that and it works, you. Thank Andrew, and then he'll have his. He'll have that technique. He'll have a video. Ricky, it. if you're on an adventure bike, you're a Honda Africa twin, and you're riding through the sand, would you stand up neutral, or would you sit down, put the rudders out, and just go? Wah. In the sand? Yeah. I would just try to, my best to stay on the bike without putting rudders out. Well, yeah, there you go. that's the first thing. We have two of the best. But you're talking, about, you're talking about if, if a situation comes up? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're dog paddling. Yeah, sure. what? right? You're dog paddling. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm never, I'm a lot. Yeah, I, 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 Jimmy so. puts all of his videos without saddlebags. You, you do look pro. When I see you on your videos in the sand, I'm like, dang, you got some skills in the sand. Because for sure, I can't do that. Because you got to slow, slow down. If you slow. No, if you practice. No, here's the thing. If you practice it all the time, like yeah, you do, yeah, and you're familiar it's, with it, it's you have easy. the balance point. No, you have everything, all that. You have everybody that gets up in the morning and steps out of their bed and they walk. They have the balance. To, yeah. to, to, so if this dude goes to the dunes or the sand and practices times, and he stays neutral, he'll, he'll look like he'll, Jimmy Lewis. He'll soon. learn it pretty soon. Yeah. But if he doesn't, yeah, he's going to look job. like Andrew Short and Ricky Brayback. We're, we're going to majority, a majority of the guys. The we're, going, we're going adventure ride, Mike Ryan. A majority of the guys are going to dog paddle for sure. For yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. It, that's the, that's Not the, all of them are. But he was asking for technique. That's the Would you stand up or you sit down? For sure, you always try to stand up, but dude. There we go. If, right on. If the front tucks, you're going to sit down. Yeah. If the front, I'm, I'm if the front down knife, you sit down. That's a, that's, a safety, that's a safety maneuver. So when your feet come off the pegs and you sit down, that's because something's going wrong and that's a last-ditch effort to save it. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. There we go. You're, yeah, you're that's two millennials. That. I'm explaining. I'm explaining. I'm explaining. Cause, their, huh? I'm explaining their techniques. No, they, these guys. They're some of the best riders. You in want the world. to know a really good technique? Don't buy the adventure bike. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> buy, buy, a, buy a 450L. Yeah, <laughs> buy an Afri When's the 450L rally coming out, Ricky? I don't know. <laughs> and all of a sudden he's quiet. Okay, we didn't hear that out loud. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Shorty. What tires are you using on your rally bike? I use Michelin. Michelin. Paddle it's tires. Desert, desert race. Yep. We actually have one good one for the sand, but for, like here, I always ride the desert just because it lasts long and has good performance. Yeah. And you did not put a new tire on your bike. 
for tomorrow. No, I'm going yeah. on day three. You're going day three. Marathon he's going to be skating like we Marathon did that whole stage. 100K road book. Like yeah. me, skating. <laughs> um, what bikes use 450FE or 450SX? I think he's asking um, what bike you're using. Well, when you're, you're on a factory rally bike right now. Yeah, but when normally you, I ride an FX at home. Yeah, so, so FX for um, training for the works and which stuff is, like that. Yeah, pretty similar. Um, so like the motocross bike, just 18 inch tire, bigger tank. And yeah. hey, uh, Victor, just get us some popsicles, and then we won't. We'll grease the the hinges on the doors. Victor is a guy who comes out the king of the motos, and yeah. he he's, he has a popsicle company. Yeah, he makes the most awesome juice popsicles. And, uh, Victor sounds like a good dude. Yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, he, he We could have used him today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we could have. Victor! <laughs> yeah. Me as a needle. So let's see. Um, the open end wrenches on the KTM kit sucks. Round off the nuts. Okay, then replace them with some good Harbor Freight. But they're ones. better than nothing when you, <laughs> yeah. you're out there. Speaking of performance, if the main focus for the bike is reliability, the rider has to make the difference. Where and when do you attack? What are you looking for? At in terms of opportunity, is there any strategy in a stage and when you're doing what? How hard is it to attack early or late in the day race? General strategy stuff. Yeah, I think this guy is on the tip of like, exactly what he's talking about is you have that's to be rally life. That's rally life. That's what's so cool about it. You have to be ready to read the situation and be ready to go. Like for Ricky during Dakar, his strategy would be completely different than mine or even my teammates, you know? So they're always, they're like on two different strategies. So one day Ricky's trying to push and make up time and then he'd be ahead. So then the next day, my teammate, his theory and, you know, uh, strategy was, he was thinking he's on a good day. So he would try to make up more time than what Ricky made up the day before, you know, it's just cat and mouse. And on a race time. that's long, like some days you wake up and your day, it's your day to push. And yeah. You know, I'm not having a good day. Yeah, you, or you, you, you everybody gotta, gets lost. Or, yeah, or, or yeah, you have, everything's going great, and then all of a sudden it's a... It's you have a, to be super fluid, and that's yeah, the best part about rally. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. And yeah, that's what's so cool. You always cool have that. opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Like, when you think it's over, the, things could just get flipped upside down, and it's, <laughs> you know, it, you just have to make do with what you have. So it's really cool. That's the best part about rally. Let's see. Um... They're saying, Ricky, they're saying you wheelie in the sand dunes on adventure bikes. Let's Dude, see. I'm, you see, I'm like, Chris yeah. Birch and those guys, like, yeah. I want to have a contest with Chris Birch on adventure bikes. Uh, you know, I remember that Dude, time I beat you. Like, in the sand? Yeah, you might beat him, but you, I'll you're beat not going to beat him I'll, him beat him him I'll do a third-gear start and beat him. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> So sorry, that's that's funny. <laughs> so Andrew was famous in motocross because you you like invented the third gear start on. I didn't invent it. Oh, come been on. Doing it forever. Yeah, so I had it down. You, you had it down, and in 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 that your bike was geared properly, and you had a special ignition tube for that. It was set up to make that start, and it worked awesome because yeah. like you were like neck engineering. You were the like king of hole shots yeah. for a while. It was like everybody knew your hole shot, and then they, and then the media caught on to it, and yeah. and it, it went kind of. So so Andrew was at a, at a KTM Adventure Rider Rally, um, and I challenged him to do a third gear start, except we couldn't touch the throttle because this is the, I it's like impossible. I turn well, you just have to slip the clutch a long ah. time. Yeah, because that's what you did. When Key you did. to third gear starts: hold the throttle wide, wide open. open. Yeah, put it in third and dump that clutch. Yeah, but your clutch is tuned. Yeah, you, your clutch your clutch was tuned for that, right? No, I just learned. It was a lot of practice. Yeah, like everything, a lot of practice. So, anyways, I beat Andrew at a third gear start on adventure bikes because you couldn't use the throttle. Yeah. <laughs> he loved it. <laughs> he didn't know what he was getting into. It's just like a joke that we, like Mark Hyde and I came up with at the beginning of the thing. So, um, okay, I think that's uh, we've definitely gone over for a few minutes here. Uh, stunt. He can't reach. What? You can't reach the ground. You're stubby. Well, well, then you can stick well, for sure you can put the riders out there. <laughs> yeah, because they don't touch the ground. Um, okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, for chiming in. Um, good times. Uh, I want to thank Andrew for actually. It's really I tortured. I, I tortured him in the in the in the uh, showing up for this. I've I, uh, uh, made Ricky do it before, so it's kind of awesome to have uh, high level guys that are you know, kind of at the peak of what they're doing, uh, join us for Tech Talk. If you have questions um, for Tech Talk, remember you can put them in the in the comments here. 
when this video goes up on YouTube, you can ask there. We'll try to get them back. And uh, one of these days, I'll sucker these guys into coming back and we'll do some more bench racing. But uh, thanks a lot. And hopefully, we'll see you guys out on the trail. Cheers. Bye bye. Okay. See you later. <laughs> okay.